Hello and welcome to the Rogers Brief for September 24th, 2023. I'm Adam Rogers. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. Uh, first of all, before I get into the stories, forgive the, uh, the bandages there. A little procedure this week and uh, a couple of stitches to cover up. Anyway, nothing too uh, serious, but enough to uh, at least conceal for the moment. We'll see how it heals. I've had a stitches in other spots, actually, in my chin on my face on my chin my upper lip and then my eyebrow and they all heal pretty well so hopefully this follows the same uh, trajectory as those ones so lots to get to this week though some interesting ones i'm a little late uh, coming out with the report uh, this week but uh, some really interesting stories to follow uh some nova scotia news so is the shignecto isthmus and the dispute over that between the federal and provincial government that was in the court of appeal this week uh, there was a sentencing done this burnside attack from uh, 2019 now so a few years ago but this has been working its way through the courts massive trial and uh, 12 individuals found guilty of an assault a very dangerous situation so the final one of those was sentenced today or this week so an interesting uh, sentencing decision there i'll get into and non-disclosure agreements, those have been in the news a lot this week with the government making an announcement. So I'll talk about how that works and try to explain that, I think, in a way that people have a better understanding of what some of the political and legal issues are behind the move to ban non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, and I guess why the government probably isn't uh, doing so here in Nova Scotia. And then... Uh, story that's making the news across the country and is uh, was the subject of some protests in a sense this week was this uh, issue of uh, gender and pronouns and how they're being taught in schools and so there's uh, that's back in court it was talked about the in or the the action that was filed in New Brunswick last week by the uh, Canadian Civil Liberties Association this is a different group now filing a similar action in Saskatchewan so talk about that and then finally the really big news this week nationally is this assassination of a Sikh leader and uh, this was out west in BC and that's made international news so I'm going to talk a little bit about the international law context and what can and might happen in, uh, in that situation. So start off uh, locally here in Nova Scotia the Shignecto Isthmus. So this is the piece of land, narrow piece of land, low-lying piece of land connecting Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, which was when Nova Scotia and New Brunswick joined Confederation agreed to. This was supposed to be an early national project, by the way, to have a, um, a canal going through there and some locks, and so that would be a transportation link between you know, basically the St. Lawrence and the rest of the country and down through the Shignecto Isthmus. Well, anyway, a different story now. That never happened. Uh, the issue now is that it's in danger of uh, flooding and degradation. And so uh, transportation links like rail links, highways are uh, at risk because of uh, climate change and the rising uh, seawaters, all those things. The question is, who pays for this mitigation effort? The federal government thinks that it should be both the federal and provincial levels. Provincial thinks it's an entirely a federal issue. And they have done a reference, the provincial government in Nova Scotia has done a reference to the Court of Appeal in Nova Scotia to answer that jurisdictional question. And it's under the Constitution. Is it an interprovincial transportation, trade, and communications issue solely under uh, the Constitution, sections 91 and 92? Uh, or is it shared jurisdiction, as I'm sure the court will conclude? Anyway, we'll see what the court concludes, but I'm sure that's what will be uh, the answer because it's important for everybody and uh, for multiple jurisdictional reasons. Uh, I was in Court of Appeal to see who could even make arguments before the Court of Appeal. Uh, the provinces, New Brunswick, PEI, Nova Scotia, were all granted intervener status, or all granted status. Nova Scotia, of course, had it. Federal government was granted by consent. Elizabeth Smith McCross and the local MLA was denied intervener status uh, by uh, the Court of Appeal. Uh, the logic being that she would, pro in, by their view, have nothing unique to say 
compared to what the province of Nova Scotia would be saying in terms of jurisdiction. Uh, not sure that would be the case. I didn't see your documents or anything, but that's uh, what the Court of Appeal concluded. So that's uh, a case that'll be coming before the courts and be interesting to watch. Like I expect the uh, Court of Appeal will find some mixed jurisdiction, but could be surprised. So we'll watch that one. Nova Scotia case, uh, big sentencing uh, decision. Well, a big, because there were so many people involved, uh, issue with this court uh, trial that was done or the Burnside jail attack on Stephen Anderson back December of uh, 2019. Twelve individuals were found guilty. They had video of all this. Uh, Ten have been sentenced, getting some serious uh, jail time for their se uh, their behavior in this. Now, uh, Anderson was, uh, they didn't find any weapons, but uh, something sharp, the medical examiner noted, uh, punctured Anderson's chest. So, uh, you know, there's some serious attack there. So this uh, Matthew Lambert was the last to be sentenced uh, of the 12. The other ones have gotten, uh, four of them got six years in jail. A couple of them have five and a half years. One got five, one got four and a half, and two of the others got four years. So this is a decision by Justice uh, Jamie Campbell, well-respected uh, justice of the Supreme Court, who handled this uh, trial during COVID, where they had to try to, f they used the uh, Nova Center as a courtroom because they needed the space with so many accused, different lawyers, the public, and just the distancing requirements couldn't be met in any regular courtroom. Uh, so this was a massive trial managed quite well by Justice Campbell. And in this particular sentencing decision, he talks about the principles of parity, which is making sure people that get equal, do equal crimes, get equal uh, sentences, and totality. So for individuals that are being sentenced on a number of things that the principle, you know, that the overall sentence isn't um, too great uh, considering everything that was done and the person's, you know, the person's characteristics, everything else about them. So in this case, Lambert would be well known for his other crime for which he got 10 years in jail. And this was a drug case from a few years ago. This is what he was in jail awaiting, uh, I think he was awaiting sentencing or if he was awaiting disposition of some sort. But he was involved in a drug smuggling case that had an out, it was on a ship in the Halifax Harbor. And the, this guy Lambert had to dive into the harbor and use some you know, diving equipment, welding equipment to get this uh, external compartment that was on the ship. He had tried to do it first in Montreal, failed, flew or, I don't know if he flew or came to Halifax, drove to Halifax. 157 grams of cocaine involved, uh, about 6.9 to 7.5 million in value, they estimated, the police estimated. So he's getting 10 years for those. And so Justice Campbell, considering that sentence and this uh, and the effect of it, he's already doing some rehab in jail. So he got the low end of the four to six year range that had kind of been established. So there was parity with the other cases, but at the low end of the range because he already had a, a 10 year sentence on that other uh, matter. So uh, interesting to see that sort of wrapping up from, uh, there was a big case from Burnside Jail. All right, so big Nova Scotia story this week. I uh, see uh, lots of media commentary on it is this non-disclosure agreement story. And so the news was that the Justice Minister, Brad Johns, announced that the province would not be banning the use of non-disclosure agreements in cases involving uh, sexual assault, sexual misconduct. This has been introduced as legislation in Prince Edward Island, uh, but it's uh, unique among Canadian jurisdictions. They've been looking at this in other parts of the United States, but uh, not, not other jurisdictions in Canada. So my view of this was that it was mostly a political decision. There's some legal reasons not to engage in it. I'm going to talk about the PEI legislation and because I know it's been used as an example of what we could have. But I really think the decision was that this is not a core priority area for this government and in a sense can only be seen as a political negative. If things go wrong and there's disruption and who knows, you know, you put the, the existing non-disclosure agreements 
you know, the uncertainty that could surround those and all of the potential risks that the government may have seen and just trying something experimental. I mean, it is experimental. It's been just started in Prince Edward Island. Nobody quite knows how it's going to work yet. And so I don't think this government has an interest in being out, going out on a limb and being the you know early adopters of experimental legislation. I think they'll just wait and see, see how it goes in PEI, see if other jurisdictions, larger jurisdictions, uh, try it out and see how it works there before adopting it here. Not a terribly unreasonable uh, step to take. So some of the, but so there's been some misconceptions out there, I guess, in the stories and some of the commentary I've seen. One misconception is that this will stop settlements from being reached. Uh, not true, but it will certainly reduce the amounts of those settlements. I mean, so when a perpetrator or an accused uh, settles in these kinds of cases, there's two reasons. One is they don't, there's a, a, a risk of litigation, a, a normal litigation risk calculation that people make in every kind of civil litigation cases. What are the chances that I'm going to win? And what are the, what's the amount I can likely gain if I win this case in court? Okay, so you take that amount and then you say, all right, what's it going to cost me in legal fees, time, and, you know, other, well, there, those are the basic things that you can calculate, is the legal fees, the effort, the, the expense it's going to cost you to get to the point where you've got the, you've received a judgment. So, and these are not all things that can be calculated exactly, but you do your best to estimate them. Okay, that's one thing. And if you're, so if you're on the losing side of that equation, you're sure you're going to lose, you, you're still going to have legal expenses, then you're going to have to pay the legal fees or a portion of them of the winning side. So there's a number of things going into your calculation of, should I proceed with this case or should I settle it for an amount less than that calculation would come to? Okay. The other side, though, is in a, a case where reputation is also an issue, which of course it would be with a sexual assault, a sexual um, misconduct case, there's the secrecy of it. And that's a major, major benefit for uh, the payor. And so if that benefit is gone, then the settlements will be reduced. They'll still take into account the litigation risk, but they won't account for the benefit, uh, the numerous benefits to the payor of maintaining that secrecy. So the PEI legislation, so it, it's really difficult to get rid of that by legislation. You could say, well, settlements shall not take into account uh, non-disclosure agreements. Okay. But you, you can say that, but settling cases is not an exact science. There's no chart that says if this happens, you get this much. It's just all sort of estimated and, uh, and agreed upon. So the PEI legislation, it says that non-disclosure agreements must be the expressed wish and preference of the person signing it. Well, okay. I'm not sure how you... Uh, indicate that other than by signing the non-disclosure agreement indicating it's your expressed wish. I'm sure that would just become standard language. Okay. The signer. The person signing it must have independent legal advice. Okay. That's sure. Of course. Uh, that's not uncommon. And if you're happy with the settlement amount, your lawyer is going to say, well, you understand what this means, right? Yes. And you'd still sign. So that's not going to have much effect. There must be no undue attempts to influence the person into signing the non-disclosure agreement. Okay, that's uh, not an easy thing to define. Now, what is an undue attempt? There must be no adverse effect on the public interest. All right, I'll come back to that because uh, that's a big one. You can waive your own confidentiality. So if you're the victim and you've signed a non-disclosure agreement, you can waive your own confidentiality, but you cannot reveal the perpetrator's name. So this is relevant for people. There's the risk that you, uh, by having a non-disclosure agreement, you can't go to your counselor, you can't talk to your friends, you can't, you know, you, you can't deal with this in any normal, healthy way 
by talking about it, well, this would allow you to waive your own confidentiality. You just can't say the name of the person on the other side. And it's not allowed to prevent the non-disclosure agreement a lawful investigation. So if there's, you know, a civil claim and there's criminal charges as well, well, a civil claim cannot prevent you from speaking to the police. It can't prevent you from dealing with a workers' compensation claim or an employment situation claim uh, as well. So um, that's, that's all prevented. So that, that last one's an important one. The problem is, okay, so what is the public interest? There's uh, arguably a case that in any important uh, person, any, you know, anybody that supervises other people, anybody that's in a position of influence, what could that be? And how big of an influential circle must you have? If anybody in uh, with you know an audience with authority over people, whether as a you know a teacher, people that work with uh, other adults, even it would always be arguably in the public interest that if such a person has uh, you know a sexual assault settlement, a sexual harassment settlement, that that be revealed. So. To me, uh, if anybody, anybody, let me put it this way, anybody who's worried about a sexual assault uh, lawsuit and has the means and capacity to settle a sexual assault lawsuit is definitely going to be a person, almost always, who is in a position of some standing where it's going to be arguably in the public interest to reveal that person's name. So therefore, uh, to me, the... The legislation uh, really means any non-disclosure agreement is going to be a risk for the person signing it. And so if you were a lawyer representing somebody that was looking at asking the person to sign a non-disclosure agreement and therefore the settlement's going to go way up and up, say, well, that the value of that non-disclosure agreement has gone way down because there's... It's so very likely that it can be uh, overridden at a later time after you've cashed your check uh, that, you know, you can just say, okay, well, actually now I'm going to reveal the person's name because it's in the public interest. Uh, so that's going to really change the way, the dynamic of that. The other solution is to not have any legislation and just let the free market decide. People do not need to sign non-disclosure agreements when they make a settlement. Uh, they can negotiate that as part of the settlement itself and not sign it. So um, we'll see. We'll see how that unfolds. Uh, I saw it was very controversial this week. I see Ron Pink was in the news, a uh, well-known Halifax uh, labor lawyer at uh, Pink Larkin, complaining about the government's approach to this. And uh, anyway, I just don't see the benefits of that PEI-style legislation. Of course, it's an issue, but there's other ways to uh, to address it. So. We'll, uh, we'll see how that unfolds as, as the legislature comes back to uh, the fall sitting. Okay, uh, next story I want to talk about. There's a couple more. These are more uh, uh, national in scope, I guess. This one is the, uh, talked about this last week in New Brunswick, the CCLA, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, has uh, started a lawsuit in, Nova, in New Brunswick. There's a group, UR Pride, an LGBTQ, don't have all the letters, uh, organization in Regina that is seeking an injunction at the moment. They're seeking, okay, so they're seeking to have the legislation declared null and void, the similar legislation to what was brought in in New Brunswick to um, have anybody that's 16 and under needing parental consent in order for their uh, new gender or new name to be used in school. And so this group, which is represented by um, Adam Goldenberg, who's a well-known lawyer out of Toronto, and so what they're seeking is to have the legislation overturned. What they're seeking in the meantime is that the legis get an injunction so that the legislation would be no force of an effect until the case has been heard. So they say it's uh, discriminatory because it forces teachers to misgender students who cannot get parental consent. They say it's a charter violation. There's Section 15 on equality 
and Section 7, Security of the Person. And they say also that it ignores the, quote, mature minor, unquote, doctrine, which allows some uh, teenagers under the age of 16 to make medical decisions, depending on their individual maturity level. And they say partly uh, the reason for their, in their injunction application argument was that it only took nine days to develop the policy at the provincial level, which is very quick. And it was clearly a case of political expediency at play rather than, uh, you know, an in-depth consideration of everybody's rights uh, while crafting the policy. So, yeah, they're looking to pause that policy while the court action unfolds. And Justice uh, Michael uh, McGow is going to give a, a... Injunction decisions are usually made fairly quickly, like within a week or so. Um, may not be uh, considered that much of an emergency to make a decision, but I think we'll get that one fairly quickly back to see where... Give an indication of where the court sees this issue going, too, if they... Because when, when you do an injunction application, you have to consider where there might be, whether there might be irreparable harm caused if the injunction is not granted. And if the court says that there is the potential for irreparable harm because some 14-15 uh, year old is being misgendered at school and can't talk to the parents, blah, blah, blah. Well, if the court says yes, that could form irreparable harm, even if it's only done, you know, for this school year or a number of months while the main case is being heard, then I guess that would be, to me, a fairly clear signal of where the overall claim is going to go. So we'll, uh, we'll watch that. All right, uh, a couple more things. The, uh, the um, Tamara Litch, Chris Barber case, and then the, uh, we'll finish off with the assassination of the uh, Sikh leader story. So the uh, Rouleau Commission, uh, people might recall from back in uh, over the winter, heard all the evidence about Tamara Lynch and Chris Barber. And so I was, uh, I was asked to go on uh, 630 CHED uh, talk radio out in Alberta to talk about this case this week. And what I was thinking, because I've been following the trial, so this is the uh, convoy leaders, Chris uh, Barber and Tamara Lynch. Well, whether they are leaders is an open question, I guess, so I shouldn't label them as such. So they are in, on trial for mischief, counseling others to commit mischief, damage to property, that is, intimidation and obstructing police. And then Chris Barber is charged with telling people or encouraging them to bre breach a court order by honking their horns after the, uh, the time allotted to them through the court order. After, I think, 10 p.m., they weren't allowed to. All right, so I was looking back, and into, you know, just to do this interview, I was looking back at the Rouleau Commission's Emergency Act, uh, you know, report. And they said some interesting things, which makes me think these two have a, probably a strong case. Now, the trial judge in the criminal trial is not going to or not expected to, uh, probably shouldn't, read the Emergency Act report, unless they've already read it just in their own, in their own lives. But they probably haven't. And so... And the evidence from the Rouleau Commission, from the Emergencies Act inquiry, doesn't in any way get brought in. But one thinks if a substantial amount of the same information is digested by the trial judge, that it's likely that similar conclusions would be reached. And so I look back to Justice Rouleau's commission, uh, conclusions from the commission, and he says some interesting things, like Tamara Litch was, okay, in many ways became the face of the Freedom Convoy, but... When describing who the organizers were, you went through a list of uh, five or six sort of more most prominent, but that it wasn't really appropriate to call them organizers because it was those those individuals were fractured in their expectations for what the uh, convoy protests were going to be. Uh, there was difficult for anybody to really assess the amount of leadership that was assumed by various organizations and there were various organizations involved uh, others uh, miss lich's uh, case these uh, bridget uh, belt and james bader botter said that she wasn't a leader that they were basically 
others. Uh, she did set up the Facebook page and the GoFundMe page, but you're allowed to do that for a protest. That's not criminal in any way. There was a, there's, at one point, there was a memorandum of understanding among these protest groups, and these two that are on trial hadn't, hadn't read it when it was announced. So that shows, I think, it's supposed to demonstrate how little, I guess, authority they had. And so the point being in all this, Oh, by the way, they also talked about how they worked with the police, tried to work with the city to limit the protest, allow people to go through. So I think a lot of that undermines the Crown case here. All that is to say is, in order for them to be found guilty of the criminal charges, the court needs to show that they were directing people and had the ability and the expectation that if they said, this should happen, you guys should go, this street should be blocked, or this street should be opened up, or whatever. If they gave instructions and passed those on publicly, that they'd be followed. Justice Rouleau, in his report, seems to suggest that that was anybody's guess as to what would happen when things were said or instructions were given. It just wasn't that well organized or not that tightly organized a movement and a situation. So we'll uh, keep an eye on that. I think they're, they're taking a two-week break for court on that one, so we'll, we'll pick that up when it comes back again. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about in this uh, week's video is the assassination of the Sikh leader, Hardeep Singh Najjar, who uh, Prime Minister says this week his murder was, there's strong allegations that it was uh, agents of the Indian government behind the killing. And... India, the country, has uh, denied this. The Prime Minister has denied this. There's been political repercussions. Ambassadors, you know, dignitary diplomats sent home. And a uh, free trade agreement, which was sort of under discussion, but not really. There was a delegation of Canadians that was going over to India to discuss this sort of uh, long on hold trade deal. Well, those trade talks are off. So uh, there's been some repercussions about this. But one of the questions is, well, can't you, can you do that if you're a country? I mean, so what, I, what India has long said about this uh, individual, Mr. Najjar, was that he was a terrorist, that he was uh, seeking an independent Khalistani state within the uh, country and was working to that effect from Canada and that, in fact, Canada has harbored many such individuals. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of history behind this. Uh, not a lot of allies backing up the Canadian position on this. The United States, the UK, Australia have all given sort of tepid, hey, let's see what happens. What well, to me was most curious when it, the news first came out was, I mean, this is a very serious thing to allege, uh, an ally, a fellow a democracy, the largest democracy in the world, of uh, an assassination on your, your, you know, your sovereign territory. But it wasn't, we know this happened. It was, there's credible allegations. Uh, that seems a little early to be announcing something that serious. And then the um, Prime Minister wouldn't give any details. I was listening to The Current and the Public Safety Minister, Harjit uh, Sajjan, uh, he wouldn't give any details. He said, oh, you know, if, and he was you know, trying to let on he was offended at the question. And then, of course, tried to turn it around at the end into, you know, the, the other parties would say, give us, give us all these details and how dare they, right? But, well, no. When there's something that this is, it's this important, and if you're that sure about it, give us some details. Like, it sounds to me like the early stages of an investigation and they don't know yet and they're still working on things. Well, then how about not upset international relations while you're gathering that? But, okay, the other qu question, can you just kill somebody? because uh, countries seem to do it. The United States does. They killed Osama bin Laden. They killed uh, the Iranian general uh, Soleimani. Uh, no is generally the answer. You have to respect the sovereign uh, territory of another country. And so you can do so with permission. You can go in and uh, you know, kill somebody if you have permission. Well, there's no permission here. And usually it's not granted. The UN Charter says also not to do this. You refrain from uh, 
threatening or use of force against territorial integrity or political independence of any state. Well, that doesn't really seem to apply to one-off assassinations unless they're some sort of a leadership person in a real leadership role, which we don't know yet whether this person was. Evidence so far does not establish that. And it really seems to deal with something large on a larger scale. Territorial integrity, that means somebody invading your territory, or political independence, that's somebody trying to really overthrow the state, not just do individual acts. Well, the exceptions are if you're in an armed conflict and there is an imminent threat posed by the person. So that would justify, in the United States' mind, international bodies' mind, the Osama bin Laden killing because it was an armed conflict and he posed an imminent threat at all times. And if the killings are defensive in nature, defending your territory rather than offensive, then yes, they are justified. So the um, problem with this is, you know, rather than arresting somebody, you kill them. Well, they don't have a, the ability to defend themselves in open court, as would normally be the case. And here, in this case, India is certainly not in an armed conflict of any sort with uh, Khalistani separatists. It doesn't, if it's, if it is any, uh, to any extent, it's very, very small. So what's the recourse? Not much. Uh, there is an international court of justice, but in order for anything to happen there, like a fine or, you know, punishment, what, uh, for the decision makers or the killers, uh, India would need to accept the jurisdiction of that court for that purpose and, um, I don't see that happening given their indications and their the uh, indications coming out of India this week. I do not think they would accede to that jurisdiction. And so uh, it looks like it'll be a geopolitical outcome and not a legal outcome in the strict sense of uh, how that usually works internationally. Well, no. <laughs> I shouldn't say how it usually works, how ideally it would work internationally. Uh, so keep an eye on that as it unfolds in the weeks to come. All right, so that's it for this week. I'll be joining uh, Jordan and Paul later on. Uh, this is Sunday evening. I'm recording this uh, in a few hours' time to talk about some of these issues and uh, other uh, police-involved uh, matters as well. So I hope you join me then. And otherwise, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.